Thank you to our persons. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Debashis for giving me this opportunity to speak on risk stratification. And uh, uh, a very warm greetings to my seniors, my teachers, and my colleagues. Uh, I would have to be honest because when I was given this topic, I was a little bit taken aback because uh, uh, although uh, uh, we at Sri Chitra, we, uh, in our OT list, we put our the RACS criteria, I've never uh, really looked into or honestly read about what exactly is this risk stratification. So uh, with that, uh, let me start the topic. Now, uh, let us assume a situation where uh, a, a patient with toothache and a patient with a probable MI visits a hospital and they are given uh, almost an equal level of care. Now, if these two patients are asked to uh, sort of rate the care, I am sure that the patient with toothache would really give a good score to the hospital, maybe 10 out of 10, but uh, uh, the patient with uh, the potential MI may not give the same score. So what is risk stratification? So risk stratification is a process where you sort of subgroup the patients into dis different categories so that uh, based on their potential risk, uh, based on the potential risk, they may uh, get the ideal uh, treatment so that the outcomes are the best. So uh, why are we discussing risk stratification? So we are discussing risk stratification because when I looked into uh, the evolution of cardiac surgery, so if you look at the evolution of cardiac surgery, I believe we have gone or we are going through three phases. The first phase was the phase of uh, innovation. You know, uh, if you remember yesterday's uh, oration talk by Dr. Shakil Qureshi, he had mentioned a timeline of events for cardiac surgery. And in that timeline, uh, the timeline stopped in 1980s. Where he mentioned that Norwood was the last major event as far as cardiac surgery is concerned, pediatric cardiac surgery is concerned. And that's sort of true. And I believe after Norwood, maybe the next major uh, new procedure probably was the last session, which was discussed in the last session, which was the root translocation procedures. So the uh, reality is that we are, uh, as far as pediatric cardiac surgery is concerned, we are in an existential crisis with respect to any innovation. And therefore, uh, after the next phase is the phase of consolidation and improvement, where I believe most of my senior surgeons here, they sort of mastered these techniques, which, were, which was there in the previous phase. And we are continuing to learn and master those events. And if you look in terms of innovation, I mean, in this phase, nothing new in real terms, although there were innovative techniques and all, but most of them are actually old wine and new bottle. So what is the final phase? The final phase is the phase of uh, evaluation and assessment. So that is the phase right now that we are in, where we are sort of uh, evaluating and assess assessing ourselves as an individual cardiac surgeon or assessing our own units as an area which gives uh, 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 quality care. So why are we in this phase? The reason why we are in this phase is because at some point of time, mortality became a major factor because more and more surgeons and more and more pediatric units started to be compared based on the mortality of the cases that they are doing. And how, how do we assess, you know, how do we evaluate ourselves? For that, the most important thing is if there is only, it is possible only if there is a common database. So this started when the international nomenclature for congenital heart surgery, the database started, which was officially adopted in 1999. So the phase of evaluation and assessment officially sort of started since 2000. So we are in that phase where we are evaluating and assessing ourselves. So what are we assessing? We are assessing the outcomes. And as this slide shows, you know, the outcomes are dependent on a myriad of factors, multiple factors. It could be clinical factors. It could be non-clinical factors. Then there are the patient factors. Then the treatment effectiveness. And then there are random events, which probably is absolutely not in our control. But these factors all come together and will decide what is the final outcome. So why do we need risk stratification? We need risk stratification because one, we need to assess ourselves. So it's a self-assessment tool. Two, the individual patient operative outcomes would be clear. Three, overall institute or center performance is evaluated. And fourth, which is very important, it avoids a bias. So you cannot say that my center is better than your center until we do a proper risk stratification. 
So what are the commonly used scores? There are many scores, you know, but I think the more popular scores are the RAC score, the Aristotle score, and the uh, STS, EAC, ETS, which is known as the STAT score. So these are the uh, probably more important tools which are used for risk stratification. And then there is a RACS too, which still needs more validation. So let us let me go through the Aristotle score. Now this Aristotle score, this was introduced in 2004 by Francis Lepo. And they actually, a group of people came together to uh, come up with this score. And they wanted to evaluate the performance of either a unit or a person. So they came up with a very noble concept, which is known as the equation of quality care. And what is this equation? So the equation is your complexity of a case into the outcome would determine what is the performance. Now, what we need to understand is that the complexity is a constant variable. So whether I do an arterial switch in Calcutta or whether I do an arterial switch in Mumbai, the complexity of the arterial switch is going to remain the same. But the outcome is variable. So the outcome in one unit may not be the same as the outcome in another unit due to multiple factors, due to multiple factors. And therefore, the overall performance is going to be varied. So this is what uh, the, this was the concept on which the Aristotle score was evaluated. So what they did is they actually sort of involved 23 countries and the multiple surgeons, and they looked into three factors. So when you are doing a procedure, what is the potential for mortality? What is the potential for morbidity? And what is the technical difficulty of that particular procedure? And they sort of gave scores for that. So if your mortality for the procedure is less than 1%, that will get a score of 1. If the uh, mortality is more than 20%, that will get a score of 5. And the same way, what is the difficulty? If it is elementary, it has got a score of 1. If it is a major difficulty, it has got a score of 5. And based on these, they gave overall complexity scores. And based on that, the Aristotle has got two scores. So one is called the Aristotle basic complexity score. And second thing is the Aristotle comprehensive complexity score. Now, based on the Aristotle basic score, here it just evaluates the procedure, the complexity of the procedure. And based on that, they have a point system where they point from 1.5 to up to 15, which are divided into four levels. So if you look at the screen, the ASD has got a score of somewhere around two, a VSD has got a score of somewhere around six, a fallow has got a score of somewhere around 7.5, arterial switch has got around 10, and Norwood, based on the basic score, has a maximum score of 15. And therefore, they divided these into four levels of difficulty from level one to level four, where the level four would be a Norwood. And since this is purely based on the procedure complexity, so the comprehensive score is much more better where they also included certain patient factors into it. And when the patient factors were included, the score or, or and then you evaluate the total point increases by another 10 and the number of levels increases by another six. To give you a better picture, now in this screen, you'll see in the upper part, there are 10 arterial switches which have been scored based on the Aristotle basic comprehensive score. And if, they, if you look at, they are pretty even. There are around 10 to 11 in range. The same patients, when scored on a comprehensive score, you can see the difference uh, and the significant difference that is uh, quite evident. So that is how a comprehensive score came. And actually, the comprehensive score is much better than the Aristotle basic score. Now, how does this scoring help? Now, if you are doing an Aristotle score, and if you, you know, sort of chart your complexity to your survival, now, the ideal thing would be, if you look at the, it should be in the right upper quadrant. The right upper quadrant are the units which has got a very high complexity and which has got a very low mortality. The survival is good. The mortality is low. So that's the ideal situation. And the worst situation is in the lower quadrant, if you see uh, in the left lower quadrant, where the complexity is less at the same time the mortality is high, which is uh, sort of uh, not ideal. Uh, a situation for any unit. I believe most units uh, in our country would be in this range where we have, uh, we have high complexity of cases and our mortality is slightly high when compared to Western centers. And that's why I gave an upward arrow, but most of the units are so, sort of moving to the uh, ideal quadrant. And most of the new units would be in this phase where they have low complexity, but their survival is high. 
Now the RAC score, I think RAC score is probably much more popular. Even we in our institute uh, introduced uh, RAC score since 2011. And uh, so what is RAC score? It is risk ad adjustment for congenital heart surgery. And uh, this was introduced in 2002. Again, this RAC score is based on the procedure. So the procedure is the primary surrogate for the risk. And we divide them into six categories. So RACS 1 has got the least uh, uh, risk, whereas RACS 6 has got the highest risk procedures. And RACS 1 to 3 can be considered as the lower risk group. And RACS 4 to 6 can, uh, are, are to be considered as the very high risk group. And uh, in-hospital mortality is the primary outcome when we look at the RAC score. But when this RAC score was introduced, at that time, the authors themselves said that this does not predict the risk of mortality. However, multiple studies subsequently have shown that the RAC score clearly can predict the risk of mortality. Also, the RAC score sort of can predict the length of stay in hospital. So how does the RAC score is better than the Aristotle score? The RAC score is better than the Aristotle score because apart from the procedure-based complexity, they also have included one important criteria, which is the age of the patient. So if you look at age of the patient, the coactation repair in an infant or a child more than 30 days is just RAX1, but the same coactation repair in a neonate becomes RAX2. Or if you take a TAPVC repair, a TAPVC repair in a child more than 30 days is only RAX2. But the same TAPVC repair in a neonate becomes RAX4. So uh, that's how the RAX score is probably, I believe, slightly better than an Aristotle score. But um, I mean, any unit can decide which uh, uh, risk stratification they need to adopt. And uh, the uh, RAX5 actually has only two procedures in this thing, which is one is the truncus with an interruption and, uh, you know, uh, the uh, and neonatal Epstein where you're doing a tricuspid valve repair. RAX6 is Norwood and a DKS procedure. Although there are many other procedures which needs to be included into the RAX, which still have not been included. But then uh, uh, these are the, uh, most of the procedures are actually there in the RAX6. So if you look at the RAC score and if you stratify yourself, you will find either yourself in the top category where you may be able to sort of uh, give equal result across the RACs between RACs 2 to 4. RACs 5 and 6 are obviously very high risk and therefore there will be some increase in mortality. Or you may find yourself in the middle area where you have sort of low mortality for the low RACs. But as you go from RACS 2 to higher uh, RACS, you will find yourself into having a slightly higher mortality. Now, uh, then a the, uh, lot of people did look into whether these scores can, are they comparable, you know? So uh, Raydi et al, they came up with this uh, wonderful article where they sort of compared the RACS to Aristotle. And then they, uh, uh, they concluded that the predictive value of RACS is higher than Aristotle, but it is higher than the basic Aristotle score. If you use comprehensive, probably you will get almost equal result. Now, both the RAC score and the uh, Aristotle score are basically consensus-based score, which probably looks only at the complexity of the procedure. So we needed a set a a score which actually looks at the actual mortality data. So if what is the actual mortality for a procedure and based on that, what would be the score? So this score, which is known as the STAT score was introduced in 2009. And this, uh, they actually evaluated, they took data from both the STS and from the EACTS database, and they evaluated more than 70,000 procedures. And based on that, they came up with what they call is a STAT score. So the STAT score is definitely far more objective because they have looked at the real-time mortality data. And this has five categories starting from one to five. And the model, base, and the model actually is uh, based on the actual mortality. Now, another interesting thing, if you take the STAT score is that they have given a very interesting difficulty ranking for each procedure. They have evaluated 148 procedures where they have given rank one, which is the least complex for pericardial effusion drainage and they have given rank 148, which is the most complex, the highest rank in, uh, they have put it in the reverse way for a double switch operation, which according to them has the highest risk in terms of mortality. Now factors that can influence the outcomes, you know, so these scores, uh, although they have primarily included the procedure, there are many other factors. Yesterday, if you remember, uh, Dr. Suresh Rao sir spoke about the low birth weight babies. So most of these course, they have not looked into the effect of low birth weight. So the low birth weight, the prematurity, 
what about many of these pediatric maybe uh, children may be having genetic or chromosomal issues and they can also have non cardiac congenital anomalies these things can affect the overall outcomes of this patient and uh, yesterday when i was listening to uh, uh, dr kk's talk he was again talking about the surgical outcomes and if you look at it and the and the upper part in one small corner he has mentioned complexity but there are so many other factors that has been included as which will affect the surgical outcome and in the lower part he has included you know like the system the system in the country uh, policies the nursing the respiratory care these are very important things as far as country as like india is concerned which can affect the overall outcomes so whether uh, you know this rack score the stat score the uh, uh, uh the aristotle score these scores are all good whether they are ideal for our country i leave it to audience to decide but i believe to an extent they are uh, they are reproducible in any country and therefore probably i think even a lot of research is still going on and evaluating these scores and they are sort of improving it by looking into other factors which can look into the outcome so in this article jeffrey jacobs has looked into the effect of chromosomal abnormalities the syndromes the non cardiac and how it affects and how it improves the overall validation validation of these scores another important thing when we are sort of evaluating ourselves is to understand the variation in case mix now this article very interesting article which shows the variation in case mix across united states and they have said that there is a significant variation in case mix across united states if that is the situation there i am sure the variation in case mix in the indian subcontinent would be much much more significant so that also has to be considered when someone is looking into stratification although this clearly says that if it is not standardized then uh, and if you are looking at the observed mortality to expected mortality of a particular unit which is not properly standardized then it actually it is sort of biased and does not give a clear description of a pediatric surgeon or the congenital cardiac surgery program now can now we are looking at early mortalities but what about uh, maybe a slightly delayed a 30 day mortality so the japanese had looked into that and they feel that the same racks or an aristotle can also sort of uh, predict what would be the 90 day mortality of these patients now another important factor is the technical performance scores now the racks the stat the aristotle these are all evaluators of individual performance but do they evaluate the technical competence of a surgeon so they uh, uh, that is what is uh, they are trying to look into and uh, because the technical competence of a surgeon also would include you know the cognitive flexibility the decision making the anticipation the teamwork and the leadership and all these factors probably can affect the outcome and when they evaluated and they came up with this uh, thing that the racks categories were found to be associated with the technical competence scores as well so if you have a higher rack score they found that the technical competence score was slight like the technical competence here they put it as class 1 class 2 and class 3 where class 1 is good class 2 is adequate and class 3 is inadequate and therefore if you have a high rack score you will find a higher percentage in the class 3 so by that what they want to say is that the use of risk stratification system to adjust patient's case complexity is essential to avoid misjudging a surgeon and the program now uh, another important thing is the grown up congenital heart disease can these now these racks and the aristotle all have been evaluated for the the pediatric patients and can you sort of use the same thing to evaluate the grown up patients because they have their own other problems many of them would be having the effects of the long standing disease they may be having poor nyha class they can have multiple acquired disorders like hypertension they could have diabetes they could have peripheral vascular disease and they have, what they say is that these racks and uh, uh, these scores risk stratification scores to a greater extent will also predict the same mortality and the length of stay in grown up congenital heart disease now what about mor morbidity we were discussing about mortality what about morbidity now the best evaluator of morbidity probably is the prism score which will uh, which actually looks into the physiology of the patient and sort of predicts the morbidity so they evaluated this score the rack score the stat score with the prism score and what they found is that if you look into it as the stat category increases and as the mortality goes the morbidity when they looked at the morbidity in the upper chart you can find that the morbidity of the 
uh, cases also increase. So to an extent, these scores will also tell you about the morbidity. However, if you really want to assess it, the PRISM score would be better than that. Now, what I need to uh, send the take home message is that the statement, our patients are sicker than yours in the current era is no longer would not be accepted un until and unless you have properly risk stratified your own data. So if we have not done, or if we are not doing risk adjustment and stratification is not done, all comparisons may be biased. There would be a tendency to avoid sicker patients or more challenging procedures in certain units, and sicker patients may not get access to better centers.